Now let's return to the game where two players are choosing which side of the road to drive on. But let's make the game a little bit more interesting. Instead of assuming that both players are Americans who would prefer to drive on the right side of the road, let's assume that one player is American and the other is British, and the British player prefers to drive on the left side of the road. So player 1 will be our American, player 2 will be our British player. If they both end up on the right side of the road, the American gets his most preferred outcome, so he gets 10 and the British player gets 5. If, on the other hand, they both end up driving on the left side of the road, the British player gets her most preferred outcome, so she gets 10 and the American only gets 5. And, of course, if they choose opposite sides of the road, they crash into each other and they both get 0. Now, if we looked for the pure strategy Nash equilibria in this simultaneous move game, we'd find the same two equilibria we found before, the one where both drivers drive on the left, and the one where both drivers drive on the right. But I'd like to focus instead on the sequential form of the game, where the American moves first, goes left or right, and then the British player chooses left or right after observing what the American player did. If they end up on the left side of the road, then we get to the British preferred outcome, so the American gets 5 and the British gets 10. If we end up on the right side of the road, we get to the American preferred outcome. The American gets 10 and the British gets 5. And if they choose different sides of the road, they both get 0. Now we've said that the easiest way to solve for the pure strategy Nash equilibria in a game like this is to convert the game tree to a matrix, where on the vertical axis we put the American, on the horizontal axis we put the British, and then we list their strategies on the axes. So the American can either go left or right, so we have left and right on this axis, but the British player has four strategies. Go left always, go right always, or go left from the first node and right from the second node, or go right from the first node and left from the second node. So now we can then transfer these payoffs into this payoff matrix. If the American goes left, then as long as the British player goes left from the first node, we get to this outcome. The British player goes left on the first node when the L appears in the first space, so in these two cases. So that's why we get these outcomes in the first two cells. If the American goes right, then we're going to get to this outcome as long as the British player goes right from the second node. So that happens in these two strategies. So if the American goes right, we end up with this payoff when the British player also goes right from the second node. In all the other cells, we're at an outcome where they're choosing different sides of the road, so they get zero each. Now we can solve for the Nash equilibria in the same way as we've been doing. Take the first strategy for the British player. If she chooses this strategy, the American ends up in this column and chooses between 5 and 0, so left is the best response. And if the American chooses left, then the British player ends up in this row, and the highest possible payoff she can get is 10, which she gets by playing this strategy. So the two players are best responding to each other if they play these two strategies, and this is a Nash equilibrium outcome. If the British player picks the second strategy, then the American best responds by picking 10 over 5, so by going right. If the American player goes right, we end up in this row. The highest possible payoff for the British player is 5. She gets 5 by playing the strategy, so once again they're best responding to each other, taking them to this Nash equilibrium outcome. If the British player plays the third strategy, the American is indifferent between the two zeros. So either of his strategies is a best response. But if he picks either of those strategies, the British player can do better because there are higher payoffs in each of these rows than zero for her. So she's never going to best response by picking this strategy. So neither of these can be Nash equilibrium outcomes. Finally, if she picks the last strategy, then the American best response by going right if the American goes right, we're in the second row, 
the highest payoff the British player can get in that row is 5. She gets 5 by using the strategy, so they're best responding to each other, taking them to this Nash equilibrium outcome. So we get three Nash equilibrium outcomes, and we can now go back and look at the trees to see what these outcomes actually look like. So let's take the first one. In the first one, the American goes left, and the British player says, I'm always going to go left. So the American goes left, and the British player says, I'm always going to go left no matter what. So the American player looks down the game tree and says, if I go right, she's going to go left, I get zero. If I go left, she's going to go left, I get five. Five's better, so I should go left. But notice there's something odd that's happening here. The American thinks that the British player, if she gets to this node, would go left. But he should be smart enough to figure out that if the British player ends up at this node, she's not going to go left because that would give her a zero and going right would give her a 5. The British player is making a non-credible threat. She's making the threat that she's going to go left if she gets to this node, even though what's best for her from that node is to go right. And the American player believes the non-credible threat, which is what causes the American player to go left and end up at the British preferred outcome instead of the American preferred outcome. So this is a Nash equilibrium that relies on the American believing a non-credible threat by the British player. The British player never has to actually exercise that threat if the American believes it because it will force the American to go left and will never actually get to this node. So unless the American calls the bluff, she's never actually going to have to exercise that threat. Merely making it and having the American believe the threat causes the American to change behavior. What about the second equilibrium? In the second equilibrium, the American goes right and the British player says, I'm going to go left from the first node and right from the second node. So the American goes right and the British player says, I'll go right from the second node and left from the first node. Now the American player looks ahead and says, if I go left, she's going to go left, I'll end up with 5. If I go right, she's going to go right, I'll end up with 10. Right is better, so therefore I should go right. But notice that in this case, the British player is not making any non-credible threats. The British player is planning to do what's best for her at each node. At the first node, which she'll never reach in equilibrium, she's planning to go left, which gets her a payoff of 10 rather than 0. At the second node, she's planning to go right, which gets her a payoff of 5 rather than 0. So she's planning to do what's best for her from each node. She's planning to do exactly what the American should expect her to do if she got to those nodes. And as a result, the American goes right, and we end up at the American preferred equilibrium. So here we have a Nash equilibrium where there are no known credible threats that are enforcing this as an equilibrium. What about the third equilibrium? Here the American goes right, and the British player says she'll always go right. So the American goes right, the British player says she'll always go right. So once again, we end up at the American preferred outcome. But there is a non-credible threat that the British player is making. She's saying, if I get to this node, I'm going to go right. When if she got to this node, it's much better for her to go left because she'll get 10 rather than 0. So there is a non-credible threat here, but it doesn't play as crucial a role as it did over here. In this case, the American says, if I go left, either of those outcomes actually would be worse for me than if I went right and the other player is going right where I get my most preferred outcome. So once the player says that she's going to go right from this node, it doesn't really matter what she plans to do over here because both of these outcomes are worse than the outcome that player one, the American, gets by moving right. So here the non-credible threat isn't actually playing an important role. 
and yet it still exists there. Here the non-credible threat played an important role because it is what got the American to go left and end up at the British preferred outcome. So we have two Nash equilibria in which we have non-credible threats and one where there is no non-credible threat. And we can wonder, should we really pay attention to Nash equilibria where some players pay attention to non-credible threats? Or should we focus on equilibria that don't include non-credible threats.